Yeah, now it's now it's on. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Okay, great. So we are happy to have Stefan Van Deren, the next speaker. Next lecturer. Yes. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm still a bit sleepy because I arrived in the middle of the night, so I'll try to be as sharp as possible. And uh, to make me even uh, be awake further, please do allow a lot of, uh, or please do ask a lot of questions. So uh, that makes it more lively and I get more feedback. Um, very good. I see my lectures a little bit as uh, uh, serving to the other lectures in the sense of building up and uh, introducing certain topics that will uh, make certain uh, uh, following lectures more uh, accessible. And so I thought uh, to uh, um, really give some basic introduction also to uh, aspects of supergravity and also black holes. Um, of course, when we talk about black holes and supergravity, we first have to learn a little bit about supergravity. So I thought I'd spend some time uh, teaching you um, the basics of uh, supergravity uh, with and without matter couplings, and then I'll also discuss some black hole solutions uh, uh, in it. And so I try to do this in a kind of like sort of a uh, little bit of a, from a new point of view or a different point of view, as you might usually see. Um, also to, to, well, um, to make it not too technical, uh, probably everybody has seen once this book and you can just lecture 500 pages or 1,000 pages about supergravity. So I, I, I kind of like distilled what I needed from it and um, oh well, let's see how it goes. So let's start with something really uh, simple. Before we go to n equals 2 supergravity, I want to go to just minimal supergravity. And in fact, even let's forget about supersymmetry for the moment. Let's think about the gauge principle, where the simplest setup is that we have a, um, a gauge field and a gauge transformation, um, which involves a um, gauge function epsilon, which is a scalar function. And of course, we know how to make gauge invariant quantities by constructing field strengths. And the action is then just f mu nu squared. And this is all, of course, uh, well known. So what you can think about now is, is, is to change this principle of a u1 gauge symmetry, where you promote this epsilon, this gauge scalar function, into a spinorial quantity. I'm going to change this into a spinorial quantity by trying to come up with a gauge principle that has a spinner, uh, epsilon, as a spinorial quantity. And so if you do this, of course, you have to change something on the left-hand side as well. And so, well, the most kind of obvious thing to do is to add here, a make of this thing a spinner as well. And we give it, of course, a different notation. It's going to be the gravitino later on, but for the, for the present remark, I don't even need to be in any, that has nothing to do with gravity at all. So this spin zero became spin one half, and this spin one became a spin three half. And of course, because this is spinorial, it has to be anti-commuting. And, um, and this field here is a spin three half field, and you can make similarly a gauge invariant combination now I suppress the spinner indices. This here is clearly invariant under the spinorial gauge transformation. And of course, you cannot repeat the same trick in making an action, say this is f mu nu squared. Uh, this we cannot do, f mu, or if you call this for the moment, this, this, you can call this psi mu nu. You cannot, you cannot make an action with psi mu nu. We know that for spinors, we need first order actions. And with first order actions, uh, uh, they only need one uh, derivative. Uh, and so the action that uh, we uh, write down for it is the Rita Schwinger action. It was, I think, written down maybe even in the 30s or something. Um, you can do this in arbitrary dimensions. And so um, the new psi rho. This is Rarita Schwinger.
and it is gauge invariant because for the notation, if you want to look up the pluses and the minuses, uh, I, I followed this book here by Friedman and Van Puyen, which I recommend uh, for both students and staff. Uh, and um, um, this is, of course, anti-symmetric, so that means that here only the field strength for this spin 3 half particle is, is, is there. So this is a spin 3 half particle. And so people have been playing with this action before the days of supergravity even, uh, Ita and Schwinger. Uh, and so if you count the number of degrees of freedom, um, of shell degrees of freedom, then. Yes, because uh, uh, this is invariant under this uh, transformation. And here only the anti-symmetric part uh, is, uh, is present, because this, this gamma mu nu is, is essentially the product of three gammas, totally anti-symmetric on the three indices. Just another sidebar. Yes, but you can do partial integration here. You get a d mu, you partial integrate, and then it's, this, and then it's the d mu, d nu that, that uh, makes it invariant. Yes, very good. Very good. Please do ask. Yeah even if you know the answer. <laughs> very good. Just choke number one. Um, very good. Uh, let's count uh, the degrees of freedom. A spinner uh, has, of course, dimensions 2 to the power d over 2, the even part or the integer part of it. That's the uh, number of components. Uh, but then this, in, this, this, this has a, this, uh, on, uh, on top of it, it's a Lorentz vector, so it has d degrees of freedom extra. So you would multiply this by d. But you have to subtract one because you have one spinorial, uh, one spinorial gauge degree of freedom that you can subtract. So the spinor uh, uh, is, again, 2 to the d minus 1. <coughs> so you have d minus 1 times 2 to the d over 2 off-shell degrees of freedom. And then d equals 4. we have 12. So an off-shell Gravitino has uh, 12 degrees of freedom. So this is Majorana. That's also important. Um, indeed, uh, in n equals, although this is not yet supergravity, but in n equals 1 supergravity, we're going to have one Gravitino, which is Majorana. In n equals 2, we're going to have two Majoranas or one Dirac uh, um, fermion. OK, so now I can couple to gravity. And we know, of course, that if you couple to gravity, we're going to introduce field binds. And these field binds, from these field binds, you can construct a metric. You can use this here. And so the metric is constructed out of a field bind just to set the notation. And you can try to um, assign a transformation rule, because we know that this is going to couple. And so now I'm, I'm going to uh, enter supergravity. And so the wheel bind on the supersymmetry has the following form. Well, you can ask, how was this derived? That, that is a little bit more difficult uh, to explain. Um, essentially, how it historically was derived was by trial and error. And um, here's the spinner, super, uh, uh, supersymmetry transformation, gamma matrices, and the gravitino. So the graviton transforms into the gravitino. And so that means that delta g mu nu is just epsilon bar gamma mu psi nu symmetrized. And so we have a metric here. And the off-shell degrees of freedom of a metric is well, we have a symmetric tensor. So that's 1 half d, d times d plus 1. But this metric also has general coordinate transformations, just like in general relativity. These are d. Uh, so you can impose d gauge conditions. So then uh, you subtract d, and that is then, of course, 1 half d times d minus 1. And then d equals 4, 
we have, uh, that is just uh, six. So if you want to build a supergravity theory um, having equal number of bosons and fermions, you see immediately, at least if you want to do that off shell, you see there's a mismatch here. We have six bosons and we have 12 fermions. So that doesn't match, uh, but of course, uh, this is an off shell counting. And if you just want to do on shell supergravity, uh, it's sufficient. Um, we know that off shell, um, this six goes into the two polarizations of the graviton on shell. And this 12, this is an exercise that you can do. This 12 on shell also goes into two. That I won't do here in this class because it's a little bit playing around with the equation of motion for the Rarita uh, Schwinger field. It's standard techniques that you also do for the Dirac field, except you have more indices. So you, you do more than with Dirac, just halfening the degrees of freedom. Um, um, and so you can look up the argumentation uh, in this book or ask me separately if you, uh, 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 you want to know how to count the degrees of freedom of a spin, uh, the on shell degrees of freedom of a spin 3 half, then uh, the answer is two. Try it first yourself. If it doesn't work, please ask me. So on shell, we do have a matching. Uh, and of course, the first supergravity theories were constructed by, well, Friedman, Ferrara, von Neuhausen. And so um, I'm going to write down the answer and restrict myself now to um, four dimensions. So n equals one supergravity. This is minimal supergravity. It's not coupled to anything yet. There is no matter. But I'm just writing this down also for the purpose of setting the stage, explaining the conventions. This here is a covariant derivative. It's no longer a flat derivative. And the covariant derivative also involves the spin connection. And the spin connection is not a new, uh, is not a new field. It's determined in terms of the wheel binds um, by a formula that probably, I guess, you all have uh, once seen. And so um, the variation of the, because this is no longer a flat derivative, um, the variation under supersymmetry of the Gravitino is something like, and here you have the spin connection, epsilon. So that is this D mu effect. And of course, uh, this is going to be important when we discuss also BPS solutions, because BPS solutions are solutions to the equations of motion that preserve some supersymmetry. That means it's annihilated by um, a particular epsilon um, uh, on the right-hand side here. Now, this is n equals 1 supergravity. It contains just the ordinary GR plus the spin 3 half field. If you are interested in black hole solutions that have no fermions excited, uh, then you look for solutions that have the fermions uh, set to 0. In this case, there's only 1, the spin 3 half. You back to GR, the Schwarzschild solution and the Kerr solutions are solutions uh, of this uh, equation of motion of this theory. And, uh, but they don't preserve any supersymmetry. This, there is no epsilon for which uh, uh, it leaves uh, the solution invariant. Also, even the, the extreme Kerr uh, solution is not a, a BPS solution of, um, uh, of this theory. You can also uh, add additional terms and construct, again, with the same number of fields, can construct a, uh, a supergravity theory that doesn't live in, in asymptotically flat space, uh, but it lives in anti de Sitter uh, space. So you can extend this. So let's call it ADS supergravity. Or if you don't, yeah, well, ADS supergravity. This is just a deformation. Later on, we will see this deformation is a gauging. And ADS super supergravity is, let's call this uh, as, as 0. Then S equals S0 plus 1 over 2 kappa squared 
integral d4x square root of g, or the determinant of the Wielbein, is also sometimes used. And then we have 1 over L. This is a deformation parameter. This looks like a mass term for the gravitino. And then there is a cosmological constant. And if you write down the equation of motion, then uh, you will see that anti de Sitter space is a solution of this with a cosmological constant, uh, cosmological constant, so r mu nu equals uh, minus 3 over L g mu nu. So we say that lambda is equal to minus 3 over L uh, 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 being negative. OK, of course, when you deform the action with a parameter, L here, that, that well, th this isn't very for, for, under supersymmetry for any L, but you have to adapt the uh, uh, transformation rules. And for instance, the, tra the transformation for the um, Wielbein remains the same, but we get, for instance, additional terms like this here, d mu minus 1 over 2L gamma mu epsilon. And that is the supersymmetry transformation rule that leaves this, this action invariant. OK. Good. Are there any questions about this? Good. Um, if not, so this is the story, basically, that uh, uh, is a story of the, of the 70s when supergravity was first discovered. And I did here an off-shell counting and off-shell matching of the degrees of freedom. But what happens if you want to construct off-shell methods? This is useful for both, well, applications to do with localization. We're going to need an off-shell formulation. Uh, in fact, also in field theory in the localization program, you often need the gravitational background as a, well, as a background, not, not propagating. But you, all, you, you often need uh, off-shell versions of, uh, of supergravity. And so this will be important also for the black hole story and the lectures of, uh, uh, of Samir uh, Murthy uh, in particular. So um, you see with the, with the off-shell, we have a problem because we have, six, uh, we have six bosons and 12 fermions, degrees of freedom. So there's a mismatch. So how to restore this? Um, I want to explain this, uh, of course, later in n equals 2, but at this moment uh, also in n equals 1. And this makes use of a program that is called the superconformal calculus. Now, this is something very technical. Many people would run away, so maybe we would lock the doors. Um, and um, I'm not going to give all the full details. I want to give, well, the ingredients of the mechanism and um, emphasize the most important uh, points. So the off-shell method we're going to use superconformal methods or calculus also called. So, of course, conformal symmetry is something very important in uh, our um, field of research, also for field theories. So some of these aspects you have even, uh, might have even seen or learned about just uh, in the study of superconformal uh, field theories without gravity. And so what is the idea here? So, well, first of all, before, let me repeat that the problem was that we had, on, that we had six bosons and 12 fermions, so there's a mismatch. We need to introduce auxiliary fields. And so um, um, historically, people tried by, by trial and error to add these auxiliary fields. And so we need to add, uh, essentially, um, six auxiliary fields, six bosons. And that can be something like a gauge field, a massive gauge field. It would have four degrees of freedom. And then a complex auxiliary scalar field. I will, I will, I will make that more explicit in a moment. Uh, or you can add a, a gauge field with a gauge symmetry and, uh, uh, and a tensor field. And if you do the counting, then you get an off-shell matching. But uh, let's see how that comes out. 
So I want to explain here what the superconformal method is. The idea is to construct supergravity theories that first have a much larger symmetry, namely superconformal symmetry. The hope is that when you have more symmetry, symmetry, it's more restrictive, it's more constraining, so it should be easier to write down actions for it. And, um, uh, and uh, 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 how then to construct ordinary uh, um, um, supergravity? Well, that is by gauge fixing procedure, gauge fixing all the generators that are in this algebra, for instance, the dilatation and later on the R symmetries that uh, are going to be um, uh, part of this algebra, but not of the Poincaré. But we'll, 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 we'll do that in detail. Um, good. So let's first get the, the main idea here. Forget about supersymmetry. And just focus on uh, gravity by itself. So we can consider, consider the action The action based on the Lagrangian L is square root of G, or minus G, and then we have one half d mu phi, d mu phi plus one twelfth r phi squared. And if you look up the conventions about the metric here, this has the wrong, uh, the wrong sign kinetic term. But uh, that's not important for the present purpose, or not too much. This action here is gravity coupled to a scalar. Ricci scalar times the scalar field here, and it has a dilatation or a scale symmetry. And the symmetry is delta of phi equals lambda, is the parameter from the dilatations times phi, and delta g mu nu is minus two lambda d g mu nu. You could check explicitly that this action is invariant under this scale symmetry. And so whenever we have a gauge symmetry, we're allowed to do gauge fixing. And it's kind of clear how we should gauge fix to get general relativity out. We should fix phi to a constant, then this term disappears. And if phi is a constant, then this becomes Newton constant. Of course, we know this also from string theory, where we uh, often, this is called the dilaton field then, or the exponent of it. So we gauge fix, since we have a local symmetry, this, this parameter is allowed to be dependent on x. And so we can gauge fix, um, and then phi is equal to square root of six over kappa, Newton's coupling constant. And so uh, then, of course, we get that L equals one over two kappa um, squared times square root uh, of G R. Alternatively, you can do something else. You can start with gravity, Einstein's general relativity, and introduce a scalar by saying, um, well, we're going to take gravity, or alternatively, we can take gravity and introduce, um, or in introduce g mu nu prime by definition kappa squared over six g mu nu times phi squared. This combination here uh, is invariant under dilatations because here the weight, this has weight minus two, this has weight one, so if we put phi square here, this is invariant under dilatation. And if you define this combination, you rewrite the action, you'll figure out that you can rewrite the action in terms of g mu nu prime, and then you just get Einstein-Hilbert term on the nose. That's not a surprise because this is how it was constructed. You can start from Einstein-Hilbert action, uh, uh, write this metric in, in this form uh, by introducing a scalar field and rewriting it such that you introduce now dilatation symmetry given by this. And if you plug it in in the Einstein-Hilbert action, you get back this. So you can see it reversely by introducing a scalar field that compensates for the scale transformation that Einstein Hilbert does not have. That's why this phi field is called a compensator. Yeah, so this is a simple trick to 
to make uh, in very, uh, actions invariant under, under uh, scale transformations. If you had a theory that was not invariant under scale transformations, you could make it invariant under scale transformations, at least at the classical level, by introducing compensators that account for the, the right scaling weight uh, in, in a scale invariant theory. Um, I'm not doing anything quantum here. I'm also not talking about conformal gravity in the form of, well, you can call this conformal gravity, but usually um, uh, people call conformal gravity based on the wild tensor. Uh, the wild tensor squared is a higher derivative theory. That is also part of the story. Once you include higher derivatives into uh, this game, you, you will get the wild tensor squared. I don't know if you will talk about higher derivative terms, uh, so may, may, maybe touch it, yeah. Um, so I will not do this, uh, uh, I will not include any higher derivatives in my lectures here. Good, this is the main idea of the superconformal method. It's just add some fields to compensate for uh, um, uh, the lack of scale invariance, or start with theories that are conformally invariant and gauge fix all the, all the transformations that, uh, or, or, or the symmetries that are not part of coordinate transformations, we gauge fix them such as you end up with just uh, coordinate invariant uh, theory. Now we have to just repeat this game in supersymmetry. The idea is still as simple, but the technicalities become a little bit more involved because everything has to be, well, sitting in multiplets, in off-shell multiplets, so this compensator needs to be part of a multiplet itself. <coughs> and in n equals, <coughs> excuse me, in n equals one supergravity, that is still uh, quite simple, but in uh, n equals two supergravity, that is a little bit more uh, involved. So let me say a few methods about, the, or a few, um, let me make a few remarks about superconformal symmetry, uh, because that's also useful perhaps for your general knowledge. So there's a superconformal algebra, and the generators of superconformal algebra are kind of can be depicted as this. It's a superalgebra, so it contains bosonic and fermionic generators. Here it contains, here, <coughs> here there is the conformal algebra, which in four dimensions is just uh, SU22, which is SO42, up to double coverings. But these go double coverings are important when you discuss fermions, and we are discussing fermions. And here are also bosonic generators, and they are the R symmetries. There can be one or there can be many. And here are the supersymmetries we call Q. But the supersymmetry, that's not the only fermionic generator. The, supersymmetry, uh, the supersymmetries are kind of the superpartners of the general coordinate transformations. But the conformal algebra also has other generators, even apart from the dilatations, also has special conformal transformations. These special conformal transformations have their own superpartners. They are called S supersymmetries. And these generators here are on the off-diagonal because they transform, if this acts on bosons, fermions, then a Q and S transform bosons into fermions, whereas these um, <coughs> um, transform bosons into bosons. So in N equals one, D equals four, this superalgebra, well, has the notation SU two comma two slash two, and it contains as a bosonic subalgebra contains the conformal algebra, which is isomorphic to SO42. <coughs> um, times U1. <coughs> and that is the R symmetry, called the R symmetry. Oh, uh, one, yes. I'm already in a, uh, uh, in a n equals two setting. Very good. In my notes, it's fine. So the conformal algebra <coughs> contains, of course, the translations. There's four 
the Lorentz transformations, that's six. Then there are special conformal transformations, that's another four. And then there are dilatations, that's one. So these are, the generators are PA for translations, <coughs> the Lorentz transformations, MAB, the dilatations, we'll call it D, and then we have special conformal transformations, KA. And of course, only the four plus six is part of a Poincaré theory. So we have to gauge fix away both the um, special conformal transformations and the dilatations, and also the R symmetry. R symmetry is not is a symmetry of the algebra, but it's not a symmetry of a Lagrangian, or at least not necessarily a symmetry of the Lagrangian. But in a superconformal theory, these are symmetries of the Lagrangian. That's why we can gauge fix them. If we gauge fix the superconformal theory, we obtain Poincaré symmetry, where, of course, these symmetries are gauge fixed. So they're no longer symmetries, because they're gauge fixed. So our symmetry is not, a, is not, <coughs> not necessarily a <coughs> symmetry of a, um, a Poincaré supergravity theory. So now you have to make, this is the algebra. Um, maybe you can write down a few commutators to make that a little bit more uh, visible. For instance, the ones you're least familiar with, uh, uh, I guess, is the ones that involve the S supersymmetry. So if you take, for instance, well, a special conformal transformation with a supersymmetry, I'm not writing spinorial indices here, then this is gamma A, gamma matrices times S. For instance, if we do translations, commutator with special supersymmetry, then that's gamma A Q. <coughs> um, what else did I write down? Oh, we can have the uh, uh, S alpha as beta. Now there are spinor indices. Uh, that's minus 1 half gamma A alpha beta. They anti-commute into the special conformal, so that's very different from the QQ anti-commutator, uh, anti-commutes into the translations. These uh, um, objects here anti-commute into the special conformal transformations. And then perhaps uh, one more. Q with S. Anti-commutes into the dilatations. That's a generator. That's a symmetry that sits in here, <coughs> minus 1 quarter gamma AB alpha beta times the Lorentz generators, and then plus I over 2 gamma 5 alpha beta times T. And this T is just the U1R, the generator of U1R. So you see how everything mixes and forms one big algebra uh, called the superconformal algebra. <coughs> so what we want to do now is to construct a multiplet um, that on which this superconformal algebra acts. In other words, we want to find a realization of this algebra in terms of fields. The next step after we construct the multiplet is to construct actions with it. But first the multiplet. So we have a lot of gauge uh, uh, symmetries here. And we know from Poincaré or from the gauge principle that once you want to make a symmetry local, you have to introduce gauge fields. And so uh, let me make a list. Um, <coughs> let me make a list. These, these gauge fields, they form a multiplet called the while multiplet. And um, so the gauge fields form the while multiplet. Um, <coughs> and let me make a table. So we have the translations, PA. B, dilatations, special conformal transformation, R symmetry, and then we make Q and S. 
Let me not make this, sorry. I like to get the cosmetics right. <clears throat> these are the bosons here, and these are the fermions. So uh, what are the gauge fields here? Well, for translations, we introduce a metric or, or the field bind, emu A. For the Lorentz transformations, well, we introduce the spin connection. But you know that the spin connection, it's actually not an independent field. You know the spin connection, uh, if you, you could impose a constraint, it's called a tetrad postulate. That's already uh, in the absence of supersymmetry. Spin connection, unless you introduce torsion, uh, the spin connection is not an independent field. It has no dynamical uh, uh, physical degrees of freedom by itself. They're completely determined in terms of EMUA. But uh, we'll give them these names. Uh, the dilatation, it's one uh, symmetry. So the gauge field is just one vector field, just like a U1. And then here we have special conformal transformation. We call the gauge field F mu A. And um, we call this here A mu. And this here is, of course, going to be the gravitino. And then there's a gauge field for S supersymmetry, which is also a spinorial field, psi mu. So the degrees of freedom of shell can be counted as follows. Now, um, when we do an off-shell count, we don't only count the number of components of fields, we impose the gauge symmetry as well. So we can use the gauge symmetry to subtract or to gauge fix certain components away. We do not use the equations of motion. That means on shell. So I already told you that um, a, a, a graviton has six degrees of freedom. But if I want to, I can use the dilatations already to uh, impose a I, 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 can, I can make various gauge choices, and later on I'm going to do another gauge choice. But I can use the gauge, the gauge transformation to reduce the six degrees of freedom to five. And here I'll write down what I have gauge fixed, general coordinate transformations plus dilatations. Then we go from six to five. This here was not an independent field. It's not an independent field, so it has no degrees of freedom. No. Be, Yes? Yes, but in supergravity, indeed, there is a torsion. Maybe I didn't say that uh, very precise enough. Well, but the torsion is induced by fermion bilinears. It's still, it's still not an independent field. The torsion component in N equals 1 supergravity is bilinear in the gravitinos. And so. You can still call that torsion, uh, um, but, but uh, my main statement is that there's still, it's still an, uh, a dependent field, the, 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 the spin connection here. So that omega has two contributions, one depending on, on the field bind, or one on the, on the field? Yes, the yes, yes. Yes, it can be written. There's a formula that um, <clears throat> expresses this in terms of the spin connection and in terms of Fermi gravitino bilinears. I can give you the formula in the break. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, there is torsion, yes, yes. You can also, the reason why I brought up torsion is that uh, already in general relativity, you can introduce torsion in the game. And then of course, the counting works differently in the bosonic part of it. Uh, and here there's torsion, but it sits in the gravitino bilinear system. Yeah. For this one here? Yeah. Um, well, this is 16, yeah. so it's symmetric, so it's 10. In, uh, let's do it in four dimensions. So we have 10, uh, 10 minus 4 coordinate transformation, that's, uh, that's 6, and that dilatation that brings it to 5. B mu here has D or 4 component fields, but special conformal transformations are also a gauge symmetry. I can use them actually to gauge away this B mu. So I'm very often one, one picks a gauge where this B mu is zero. So then there is no off-shell degrees of freedom here because I fixed here the special conformal transformations. Now, a little bit of a longer story here uh, to see that F mu A 
is also not an independent gauge field. There's lots of gauge fields here that are um, uh, not independent. Well, the spin connection you all know, but these, this one and this one turn out also to be dependent on the other fields. How can you know this? Well, you cannot really know this in advance. What people do is you, can, you, you construct actions and then you see that the equation of motion for f mu is algebraic. It's like an auxiliary field almost. It's algebraic. And when you eliminate the equation of motion, uh, then you find that f mu is a function of the other fields. You can do, in fact, the same with the spin connection. If you would not impose a tetrad formalism and uh, a postulate and so on, you essentially figure out that you can use the equation of motion, start with two independent fields and then use the equation of motion. The equation of motion will put omega as a function of e. So that happens for this one and this one as well. If you want to understand it a little bit more in detail, then uh, you should really consult this book, uh, otherwise I will spend too much time on this. Uh, yes? Uh, so yes? So because you say you can write down the equation of motion, you automatically find that it's, it's, uh, it has an algebraic relation. But I can choose different constraints, and these different constraints will give me a different uh, algebraic relation. But now you're saying that the equation of motion imposes some kind of special Correct, yes. So these different constraints, I, I had exactly the same question when I was preparing this lecture. And luckily, Bernard de Witt was uh, still in Utrecht, so I could ask him, like, why should I choose this constraint? I don't want to choose anything. What, what happens if I choose something different? And he says, OK, it's still the same principle. There will be the equation of motion, but it will be late. Your, our two choices will be related by field, uh, field redefinitions. Well, you have to make sure that your algebra is, of course, uh, holds off shell. Uh, and then these constraints are usual curvature constraints. Uh, and uh, at least the way I understand the topic is that there is there's no different choices that lead to different theories. The, the different choices that you will make lead to physically equivalent theories. And the relation are just field redefinitions. They can look complicated depending on what precisely we choose. But uh, if you have a concrete example, maybe we can discuss afterwards. Uh, yes. yes. Ah, uh, very good. Um, um, how shall I phrase this? Um, I can be off shell, but we still don't count this as dynamical degrees of freedom. If you are in n equals 1, um, well, let me. Yeah. They are algebraic, right? They're algebraic, yes, yes. That's right, yes, yes. Yeah, but that's still an equation of motion there. Um, you do it with just imposing the constraints. It's not really taking it. That's right, yeah. That's the language in which we usually we impose a constraint, which can later on also be understood as an equation of motion. But I agree that's a little bit confusing. So I would like to think a little bit about this uh, to answer this more, more sharply, yes. Um, here we have a gauge field, uh, and that's three. And um, here, um, this here would have 12 degrees of freedom off shell, but we have more supersymmetry. I haven't gauge fixed the S supersymmetry. That's a spinor. So you can reduce four components out of the gravitino further down to from 12 to 8. So here I fixed uh, both Q and, uh, and S. OK. Um, yeah, I think the answer is, now let me not tempt, uh, because I might give a wrong answer, that these equations of motion are so special that even if you I impose them, you are still off shell. If you, you don't need the equation of motion in the, uh, uh, to close the super algebra for these fields. I think that is the answer. And so you're kind of both imposing equation of motion, but you're still off shell from the point of view of the closure of the superalgebra. But I will double check that. 
Good. So now you see we have a matching because uh, we have eight here and eight here. Now, this is not the end of the story here because um, with this, this is a multiplet, it's called a while multiplet, but with this multiplet by itself, you cannot make an action. It's not because you have a multiplet that you can write down an action. We've seen this already in this toy model for gravity because we needed to, in order to make the theory invariant, we needed this compensator. This compensator was a scalar field. There's no scalar field in here. So to make, or you can also say, phrase that in different ways, and this is maybe a chiral multiplet, and in order to make a full density, you need to multiply it with another uh, antichiral to uh, have a full density. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail uh, at this moment. Um, I think from the, the toy model uh, gravity, you see that, that we need a compensator. The compensator is not part of the wild multiplet, and so it is a multiplet by itself, and that multiplet, because it has a scalar field, the most canonical thing, of course, to do is to introduce a chiral multiplet compensator. There's, there's different choices for the compensator. One is a chiral multiplet. If you go to the gauge fixing, you get old minimal supergravity. If you use a tensor multiplet, then you get to new minimal supergravity. And let me for the moment just do the chiral multiplet. So a chiral multiplet contains a complex scalar, a spinner, two component spinner, wild spinner, and an auxiliary field, complex field F. And so now I'm going to make this exercise again, um, now including, um, including this compensator. And now the counting works somewhat differently. Yes. What is compensating uh, for the dilatations? Yeah. Well, it will do the entire job. Um, so, um, so let's add this compensator here and do this exercise again. We've seen in, the, in this toy model that, I, in fact, I used the dilatation symmetry to, to fix this scalar into a constant, yes? But I had already here fixed it, uh, fixed the field bind. I cannot fix, uh, fix the symmetry twice. So I'm going to drop it here and turn this back into a six. Yeah, then, um, so I'm going to now add this list here to this list. I'm going to add um, phi, lambda, alpha, and f. So how does it change then? For me, it's easy. I just use the eraser here. You can just copy it or I will probably put my notes online as well, or you can watch the video. So here, we make it a six, and we only fix the general coordinate transformations. Um, and so, oh, I'm sorry. I should put this here. Phi, lambda, alpha, and f. So this is a complex scalar field. If I have dilatations, then if I have dilatations, then um, uh, I can fix the real part of it, or I can write this as a real part times a face. And this complex scalar field is charged, so it has a it has a weight under this one here. And so I'm not going to eliminate a degree of freedom here. I'm going to use the U1 symmetry from here and the dilatation from here to gauge fix this scalar. If I do that, I cannot go from four to three here. So this remains a four, and this becomes a zero. What I have gauge fixed here is dilatations plus U1. Similarly, this eight here was arising because I was uh, using gauge fixing both Q and S symmetry. And so if you just use Q supersymmetry, then I had 12 off-shell degrees of freedom. And I'm going to use the S symmetry, supersymmetry, not to gauge fix the gravitino. That would not be so smart because I want to have the gravitino as it is in Poincaré. So we're going, I'm going to gauge fix this one away. So then, then this becomes a zero as well. And I've used S supersymmetry to gauge fix the, um, 
fermion in the chiral multiplet. Then I'm done, because this one stays there, and that's two degrees of freedom. And if all goes well, I should have now off-shell equal bosons and fermions. Six plus four plus two is 12, and 12 uh, from the gravitino. So this is an off-shell counting of the wild multiplet already including the compensator. Yes. Well, if you go, but th th then, then it's an on-shell. It's a little bit the same confusion as what I had here. Um, um, of course, if you write down actions for this, this is an auxiliary field. If you don't couple it to anything, then this f is just zero. Uh, but off-shell, it, it has two components. And this one you need for the closure of the superalgebra. Right. Yes. Well, you have to go through all the details here, um, um, and I, um, th that problem is going, well, it's not really a problem, but this, this elimination of some of the auxiliary fields is going to become a complicated exercise, in fact, also in the n equals 2 story, where I have lots of gauge fields that I can eliminate, and they become functions of the other fields, and then you have to s figure out what that relation precisely is. Um, but for now, I'm just giving you counting. Uh, And so the act, well, I'm going to write down the action. You'll see what the equation of motion of f is. It's still going to be zero. And so the on shell, uh, the on shell action, uh, sorry, off shell supergravity, this is called old minimal, is just S equals d4x square root of g. 1 over 2 kappa squared r minus psi bar mu, gamma mu nu rho, d nu psi rho, plus 6 a mu a mu, close this bracket, minus f times f bar. You say a few words about it. This looks like I have a massive vector, and that's precisely what it is. Um, uh, but it doesn't couple to anything, but there is no gauge degree of freedom. How, how, could it, how, how, how did it arise? Because this scalar field was charged under U1. And if it's charged under this U1, but I gauge fix it, remember that um, uh, uh, the, the real part of it, I gave an expectation value. Yeah? I'll gauge fix it to a constant. And of course, in its kinetic term, there's a d mu phi, d mu phi, covariant uh, d mu. So there's going to be an a mu, a mu, phi, phi bar, just like in the Higgs mechanism, if you want. So you gauge fix that, and this term, this term uh, remains. And this is just the FF bar term that you have for any action of a chiral multiplet off shell. And in this particular case, uh, the eliminating a Fourier equation of motion is trivial. Uh, very good. Are there any questions? Yes, yes. Yes, yeah, that's right. Are there any, uh, are there any other questions? Um, well, but that, that, in this theory, you cannot do that because that's against the equation of motion. But yeah, uh, you, you, you can, I will do gauge supergravity later on. That's a, a, one, one layer of complication after the other. Um, so you see here that this was the action that I, the on shell action I wrote down before. The equation of AMU is AMU equals zero. So this whole exercise was pretty, in some sense, uh, well, you didn't gain much, except that you have an off shell formulation here. Okay. So now, uh, we repeat the same exercise now in a uh, n equals 2 setting. So um, let me first, Wait, yes? Ah, with the new minimal, you start here with a tensor multiplet. So a tensor multiplet has, what has a, ten a tensor multiplet has a tensor, a real scalar, and a fermion. And now what you do is, now you have a real scalar, so you can only, 
impose a gauge fixing condition on, um, on, the, on, on, on the real part, so the tensor remains. And so then you're still left with the U1 symmetry. I cannot use it to gauge fix here. So this AMU really becomes a, ga a gauge field there. And that's new minimal. So all these uh, old formulas, the old minimal and new minimal, they have a very natural interpretation. Well, if you call this whole program natural, uh, a natural interpretation in terms of the superconformal uh, uh, method. So the idea is make a bigger theory with more symmetry, add compensators, gauge fix, and you get Poincare supergravity off shell. So is there a simple way or any way to see the equivalence between minimal and, and new minimal, or minimal and new minimal? Only, yes, uh, only if you go through this uh, uh, superconformal method. Well, equivalence in the sense of um, on shell, you start to see that they become equivalent. Off shell, they use different compensators and they, they become, well, classically, they become equivalent. I don't know what the status is about, about the quantum theory, whether, whether these, these, these differences show up. Maybe Atisha knows there's something there's about it or somebody else. There's a question, but maybe I'll, I'll ask you later on. Uh, so when you used to do rigid uh, supergravity to couple to some fields, then the question is, this is not completely quantum, but it's sort of something in between, right? You use a background, an offshore background to couple to a quantum field theory. And the question is, is then again whether these two... Um, I don't know what the, I understand the question. Um, I don't know if the answer is known, and if it is known, I don't know it. Uh, um, so I don't know, I am absolutely sure the loop corrections have been studied in, in, in both on shell, uh, uh, old minimal and new minimal, but I don't know what is the status of the art. I, 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 I think as far as people could judge, they still lead to equivalent theories, otherwise we, this would have really been emphasized more in the literature, I think. But maybe maybe some people in the audience know better. Uh, yes. Uh, how heavy is gauge invariant in the here? Well, it's not gauge in, invariant anymore. It's 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 uh, it has four degrees of freedom, um, so it's not it's not gauge invariant. Well, it was gauge invariant in the theory where it was not gauge fixed, but I gauge fixed the U1 and the dilatations such that. Um, it is no longer gauge invariant. That's not a problem here because it doesn't couple to anything. It doesn't give charge to anything, uh, and so it is just an auxil is just auxiliary here, or algebraic, if you want. To. So it's not it's, it's not stupid, like it's not like AMU minus delta nu pi or something like that. It's just like well, I think it, the right way of saying it's Stuckelberg is uh, before you do the gauge fixing. Yeah. But not here anymore. Yeah. Or maybe that's still called Stuckelberg. Maybe it is. Yeah. OK. Um, I have two minutes or something. Um, I just want for fun to um, say in two minutes the n equals 2, because now um, then we see what, uh, what will come to you tomorrow, or no, this afternoon. So in n equals 2 supergravity, it's just a simple remark that I will make here. Well, we have, of course, two gravitinos. i equals 1 to 2. That's what n equals 2 means. And there's still only one metric. Let's not worry about off-shell. Off-shell will come this afternoon. So this at 2 degrees of freedom, so on-shell, This had, each gravitino on shell had two degrees of freedom. It was this exercise that we didn't make here. There's 12 off shell, but two on shell. But now I have two of them, so that's four. This one still has two. So on shell, there's already a mismatch here. And so you have to compensate that or add another field um, that compensate for this. And of course, what immediately comes to your mind is a honest to God gauge field, uh, which in four dimensions has two uh, on shell degrees of freedom. And so now we have 4 plus 2 plus 2. 
that suggests already that n equals 2 supergravity, at least without any matter couplings, this is called the Gravi photon, because it's part of the gravi, uh, gravity multiplet, that the minimal supergravity not coupled to any other matter uh, is just Einstein Maxwell coupled to and then added to it uh, a spin 3 half particle. And in Einstein Maxwell, of course, we have the Reichner Nurstrom black hole, and, um, um, and we can start thinking about black holes and extremal and BPS and so on. But uh, I think I should, I should stop here and continue this afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>